Greetings, I am Herbert Erpaderp, and today I'm going to build this plastic IS-2 heavy tank by Warlord for their game Bolt Action. This is the first of a series of kits I bought with Patreon money, and so I want to start this by saying a big thank you to my patrons who've made this possible. You are all awesome. Thank you. I quite like the artwork on the front of this box. The IS-2 stands triumphant next to some fire while a dejected looking King Tiger burns in the background. Cool. The back of the box has a couple of paragraphs about the IS-2's history and role in the Second World War, and as you can see there's also some images of the completed model, the included tank riders, stat card, decals and damage markers. Pretty much what you would expect to see on a Warlord box. Inside the box we get one sprue of Soviet infantry to use as tank riders, or just to bulk out your Soviet army. That's what I'll be doing with them. I really like that these are included. Soviet armies need a lot of bodies. I have built these before and so I won't be repeating that in this video. There's a link to that build video in the description and in the card on screen now. For the tank itself there's this instruction booklet which is much like the booklet in the other Warlord plastic kits that I've built recently. That is to say, it's pretty good. The instructions are well laid out, clear and easily understood. Those paying close attention though might notice the steps go G, H, J, K. Where's the I? Perhaps it got eaten by a Gru. The last couple of pages of this booklet have a painting and marking guide which is helpful. I especially like the one labelled IS-2 model 1944, Combat Girlfriend. I got a good chuckle out of that. It's probably a little bit less silly in Russian. Also included is this baggie of damage marker stuff. I'm starting to get quite a collection of these. Then there's this stat card for the tank, which includes a bunch of relevant information like its points cost, weapons ranges and special rules. And of course there's this decal sheet. There's a lot of different markings here which is always good. Everybody likes options, right? The instruction booklet leads me to believe the slogan at the bottom right reads, Revenge for Hero Brother. Last but not least, there are two sprues of tank that come wrapped in a plastic baggie. This will save any pieces that inadvertently come off the sprue from being lost. The plastic in this kit is made by Italeri and it is available in Italeri's own packaging, sans infantry figures, markers and cards of course. This might be a cheaper option if you just want the tank by itself. The parts on these sprues are quite neatly moulded and I can't see any flaws or moulding errors. Of course, that doesn't necessarily mean that they aren't there just that I can't see them. It's not very well lit, but there's a tank commander as is often the case in Warlord's tank kits. He looks reasonable, but I won't be using him. That's got nothing to do with the quality of the figure, I just don't really like including the commander figures. All of these parts are crisp and quite nicely detailed. There are of course mould lines that will need to be removed, but other than that these parts look quite good on the sprue and they look like they'll go together very nicely. Let's see if that's the case in reality. As is often the case with these tanks, I start by assembling the track sets. One thing I noticed is that one of the top track pieces is numbered incorrectly in the instructions. It says part 46 in the instructions, but the part number on the sprue is 43. Not really a huge deal, just pay attention. Assembling these is a simple matter. The idler wheel and drive sprocket go on first. The drive sprocket is keyed to ensure you do it right, with the teeth facing inward. I then attach the bottom run of tracks. These have keying to ensure you get the tracks around the right way, which I do like. I apply pressure and let the glue set for a few moments, then I attach the end parts. There's a tab on the ends of these that links into a slot on the upper and lower tracks. That's why I put these on before the upper length of track. They go on easily enough and are probably the most gap free that I've seen this style of track so far. At least on the actual tracks themselves. I then glue on the top section of track. It goes on just as easily as the others. I apply a bit of pressure to try and minimise the gap between the track and the sprocket and wheels. Unfortunately there's still a bit of a gap between some of the wheels. The track just doesn't look like it's actually sitting on them, but hovering slightly above. It's especially noticeable at the idler wheel on the left side and the drive sprocket on the right side. That said, the tracks do look good, they're just not perfect. Then they can be glued onto the lower hull part. These go on without issue thanks to the helpful keying. As usual I apply pressure to try and eliminate gaps between the inner hull part and the sides. Next I add some details to the lower front of the hull. First, this large section of spare track links. They have raised nubs on the back that slot into the two central holes. I wasn't really sure which way these should go up, but I think I got it right. With a little nudging to get the alignment right, this goes on easily. 
I then add the two additional spare track links to either side. These aren't hard to install, though I think maybe I've put them on upside down. The real problem is they look pretty different to the larger set of track links. I mean, it's not a massive difference, but it's enough. I would imagine they would be identical on the real thing. A small complaint, I suppose, and from a distance, nobody will be likely to notice at all. I then install the lifty towing hook things. I'm pretty sure I installed these the right way up, with the larger, more open end of the hook facing downwards. Use tweezers for victory. I think the result here is fairly decent. The rear end also gets a similar treatment. Two spare track links which look reasonable enough, and also two of the hook things. It says to add these a bit later, but I figured because I'm such a rebel I would do it now so I could clean up all of the tiny parts at once. Next, I attach the upper hull. This is easy and it fits very well. I was initially a little concerned about the front of the hull. The spare track links do protrude up a little bit above the edge of the lower hull part and I thought they might catch and prevent the parts from going together. But it turns out I was worried about nothing. As usual, apply pressure to minimise gaps. The join at the front here is actually really nice. Almost no gap at all. Moving on, I add more details to the hull. First is this shackle thing. Mounting pins make these detail parts very easy to install. Only a little nudging into final position is needed. The front of the hull gets a headlamp, and then a horn. Next comes a toolbox, which is probably a great place for storing vodka. The three bumps, which I guess represent latches, should be on the outside like so. I then attach the saw. This is useful because the tank doesn't have the traditional Soviet log, but at least with this saw, the crew can get one for themselves. Then comes a shovel, which goes here. And then this box thing. I have no idea what this is for. Maybe it's potato storage. Or vodka, which is liquid potatoes, and therefore good for you. Then I add the rear of the hull. This goes into place quite easily. There is a bit of a gap around this part, but that's realistic enough. Onto that plate, I glue the travel lock for the gun. I like that this is a separate part. It adds a bit of extra three-dimensionality to the model. Now to make some fuel drums. These are pretty simple to put together, though they do go together in a particular way. Make sure the strap parts line up on both halves of the barrels. Unfortunately, the ends of these just look awful. They actually look like these were intended for there to be end caps, but no such parts exist. This is really unfortunate. Their appearance should improve with a little bit of filling, but I shouldn't really have to do that. I suppose it's not the worst thing ever, it's just a little bit annoying. And it just seems really poorly thought out by the designer. I was kind of tempted to leave these off. I know the IS-2 didn't always have the barrels, but they do sit in little racks which would still be on the tank, even in the absence of the fuel drum, and I couldn't be bothered trying to make some of those, so I glued the barrels into place. This was very easy to do, and I like the way that they've designed this part of the barrels. Still, the fuel barrels are the weakest part of this hull. To finish the hull we could add these cables, but to be honest they're kind of fiddly to attach and I'm not really sure I like them. At any rate there would be a pain in the dick to paint around, so I'm leaving them off until I paint the tank, at which point I'll decide if I do actually want to add them. I tuck them into the hull so I don't lose them, and now it's turret time. I start by assembling the turret front and matlet. This part is meant to go into the back of the turret front here and then be glued into the matlet. As you might be able to see, this is a little bit fiddly. The part won't join flush with the back of the matlet and there's a massive gap there. I gave up on using the internal component here, and figuring that this was about the best fit that I'm going to get with this, I glue the matlet into place. I'm really disappointed by this. Sure, it's not the worst thing in the world, but it did tilt me out just a little bit. Moving on. I then attach the turret sides to the turret bottom. There's a tiny little lip in the rim of the turret bottom that guides the sides into place. I would prefer this to be a little bit bigger, but it does work. There are semicircular cutouts on both parts that form holes for handrails. These can be used as a gauge to see if you've got these parts lined up correctly. Still, this is a little bit fiddly and definitely not one of my favourite turret assemblies. Surely the designer could have done this a little bit differently. The key to putting this together is patience. Go slowly and do your best not to bump the parts out of place. The roof can then be glued on. Attach this gently too. None of the connection points are very solid here, though once the glue is dry it should hold together well enough. Then I glue the turret front and matlet assembly on. This has guides to prevent you from installing the part too high up on the turret, but none for lateral guidance, though it's not difficult to get it on neatly enough. I then glue the commander's cupola in place. It kind of locks into place here. It looks reasonable enough to me. 
Then I install the gun. This is keyed and goes on with no issues. It is a little more elevated than I had thought it would be, but that's not really a problem at all. Time for hatches. First, the loader's hatch, which is another slightly irritating part to install. You are meant to be able to install this in the open position, and there's a hole in which to mount it. However, the hinge part is too wide to fit into that hole. It also doesn't quite lay flat when you try to install it in the closed position. I trimmed down the hinge part to make it a little thinner and then glue it into place. It didn't end up looking too bad, really. I then move on to the commander's hatch. This was more frustrating than the loader's hatch. I suppose I should have test fit first. That was a failure on my part. The issue is the parts don't quite sit next to each other in the hole, so either they both tilt slightly inward or outward. Or as I went with, they sit flattish next to each other but the hinges on one side stick up way too far. I really didn't want to pull the parts apart and try to trim them down because that would have made a huge mess. I suppose I'll just deal with it and move on by installing the commander's machine gun. This goes on easily, though it did make me realise that I'd installed the cupola backwards. I'm pretty sure the mount for this gun rotated around the cupola anyway, so maybe that's fine. Next, I install a bunch of these hook things. These aren't all the same, so it's probably a good idea to be sure you're gluing the correct part into the correct location. Refer to the instructions for this. I found it a bit fiddly to get a good grip on these with tweezers, but I did manage to get them on with my fingers. They required quite a bit of fiddling and nudging, and the guide things on the back of them were more of a hindrance to their installation than anything, so I trimmed those off. Eventually I got them all in place. This was a little bit frustrating, but no more than tiny little parts that are hard to hold with tweezers usually are. Then the machine gun on the turret rear can be glued in. This goes on with no issues, surprisingly enough. It actually looks pretty good. To finish this build I put some hand railings on. Be careful when removing these from the sprue and cleaning them up. There are no spares, so good luck to you if one goes flying. These are actually not that bad. I was even able to easily put them into place without using tweezers. They fit nicely into place and look quite good. Not too chunky. They could probably get broken quite easily though, so do be careful of that. The turret locks into place very easily, and that's the plastic IS-2 from Warlord and Italeri complete. Sadly, I don't have any other IS-2s in this scale to compare with, but if I ever do come to own one, I will be sure to compare them. So this model doesn't look too bad. I mean, you can clearly see that it's an IS-2, and it is reasonably well detailed. Some parts of this build process did leave me feeling a little bit frustrated. Maybe I was just a bit salty in general that day, but some of this kind of tilted me out, particularly the poor fit of the mantlet. The fuel drums are bad too. It's probably a good thing I don't do these things live. My notes actually have swearing in them, which is unusual. In my opinion, the flaws in this kit are worse and more noticeable than that awful hull MG on the Italeri Warlord Panther that I built a while ago. A lot of the model is really well designed and it seems to have a lot of thought put into it, while other parts just seem half-assed at best. Which is a shame, it could have been so much better. Maybe it was rushed into production or something, who knows. So in the end, this isn't an awful model. In fact, for the most part it looks pretty good. It's probably far superior to Warlord's Resin IS-2 anyway. I think this is actually the only choice for a plastic IS-2 in this scale. Anyway, enough complaining. This kit will definitely benefit from a little bit of putty, and I'm sure it will look excellent on the table with a nice paint job crushing puny kraut tanks beneath its mighty tracks. What do you think? Let me know in the comments section below. And of course, don't forget to do things like subscribing here on YouTube and following me on social media. And if you really like what I do, you can always help support the channel over at Patreon. That would be awesome. Check the links in the description for further information. I shall return soon, so until then, happy modelling and thanks for watching. Farewell.